to cut content. What did the anime change? Episode zero, Hajime's past, and the new world from any news. Let's see what he has to say. Give it to Adi me. Fureta had a bit of a rocky start. Why? I mean, the source material is rated quite highly, yet the anime doesn't seem to follow in its foot. CGI. Shitty CGI. That's all there is to it. A lot of people put emphasis on animation quality over everything else. I personally don't give a fuck about animation quality. As long as there's a good soundtrack and good voice acting and a compelling story, that's all I need. Animation quality is one of the last things to check mark. But a lot of people actually fucking hate that. So it is what Full it steps. is. And that's because the anime went full steam ahead and really rushed episode mm. one. And the pacing, my bad. It's, you're right. It's the CGI and the pacing. The pacing was actually so fucking cracked, which I didn't really mind at times, but still, obviously, light novel readers are going to be upset. For context, they jumped right into chapter two of the light novel, which means they skipped approximately the first 30% mm. of volume one, only ever briefly referencing it in flashbacks. But that's why we have this series. The princess, bro. The fucking princess. Yo, she didn't exist. Like, straight up, season two, episode one, this princess, this blonde princess is introduced, and I'm like, what, what, what the fuck? Do I know this person? There is no way they actually retcon this princess into the story because the anime forgot to cover her, right? That's exactly what the fuck happened. Theories. So we can go episode by episode and take a look at what the anime skipped from both the light novel and the manga. And as I've done with Overlord, Goblin Slayer, and most recently, the... Yo, what the? Hold up. Did you, see, did you see that? Yo, what is going on in Goblin Slayer, man? Yo, maybe we need to check out Goblin Slayer, man. Why is no one telling me to watch Goblin Slayer, man? What is, what is this art, bro? Why? What is going on here? Recently, the Rising of the Shield hero, I'll try to cover the most important scenes that help develop both the characters and the world, as well okay. as go more in-depth into how the world's magic, combat, and... That's why we made you watch episode zero. You're right. And it's crazy because if I just jumped into episode one, uh, season one anime, Arifurata, I would not have known anything that's going on. It would have been just such out of context shit. It's like, why the fuck is this kid just stuck in the bottom of a labyrinth? What is going on here? Who are these people? Why are we even here? You're right. Episode zero is actually so helpful. And leveling systems function. That way we can really get a grasp as to the type of setting that we find ourselves in with this new isekai. So let's begin the cut content for Arifurata from Comic-Con I'm going to start with the prologue, which covers events from Hajime's days in school before being teleported to the fantasy world of Tortoise. But there is- <laughs> This place is called Tortoise? I didn't even know, straight up. I just didn't- I didn't know- I didn't think that we had a name for this place. The possibility that these events could be covered in a flashback. However, it's not looking likely since we're already three episodes in and the window to showcase these events seem to be closing or are already long past. Anyway. We have our main character, Hajime Nagumo, falling mm. into a pit of darkness, causing his whole life to flash before his eyes. Oh Leading no! Us to the events from a few days earlier, a normal Monday, back in the real world. And this was Hajime's most depressing and hated day of the week. Huh? You see, Monday relatable. Meant he had to go to school, and relatable. Hajime hated going to school. From <laughs> he hates Mondays because Monday means that he had to go to school, and Hajime hates going to school. <laughs> I don't know, that's just so funny to me, but relatable. Also, what's going on here? Looks like this girl's covering her skirt right here. The moment he'd walk into class, he'd be greeted with glares from mostly every student. The fuck? As if his Why so mad? Immediately soured the air. Why then so mad? He sat down. Best girl. I'm starting to realize more and more that Shizuku might be the best girl in this show. He'd be tormented by his classmate, Hiyama. The this motherfucker is still alive and still backstabbing Meld, bro. Okay, Meld like survived the attack. This and Meld could have killed Daisuke too, but he didn't. This piece of shit. When is he? When am I gonna get my divine retribution, bro? Sorry. When is he gonna get his divine retribution? I want fucking revenge. This kid needs to suffer. He can't just die though. We need to make him suffer. Parent leader of Hajime's harassment campaign. He'd always make fun of Hajime for being an otaku. One that would stay up all night playing video games or reading manga. Sometimes I forget this is even like an important uh, identity of Hajime. Of him being like a weeb is like an important thing. Because the reason he's an outcast is because he's so immersed in manga and anime and games. At school, no one can relate to him because no one else is like an otaku. But Hajime is. But like that's been completely forgot. Like they meant no Kaori mentioned it once. They started mentioning like manga stuff to make like UA jealous. Like you don't really know him. I know him more, but god damn I forgot about that shit. Then show up to class the next day and just sleep through its entirety. Based. Which were all technically true statements. Great. Play video games all night, manga enthusiasts sleep through class. Yo, this guy's living the fucking dreams. But it's not like he was a weird guy to interact with. 
Sure, he really liked to read light novels and play games mm. and didn't really talk very much, but he was still very much able to hold a normal conversation. He was, by all means, an average student. Yeah, so normal dude. So why the poor treatment then? Well, that Why the poor treatment? Because this is one of those shows where the main character gets bullied or gets looked down upon so that we can have some kind of like pop-off revenge story. I know that this isn't the revenge story. I know that Hajime has given up on revenge a long time ago. He's an enlightened being. He doesn't need any of that shit. But, you know, quite often characters in these kind of animes are looked down upon and kind of like, what's the word? People just treat them really poorly so that later on when we get OP, when people start to recognize us, it's going to be that difference in how we get treated is the fun part, at least to me anyways. That was for a different reason. You see, there were very few people in the school who treated Hajime kindly. Yeah, and just the two girls. was Kaori Shirasaki. She was the most popular girl in school. Often, I'm honestly so mean to Kaori recently because I don't know why I'm being mean to her. I think it's just because we got different waifus and I kind of wanted to flex to Kaori as well, even though she's such a nice girl. She was there for Hajime from the beginning too. Called a goddess by many. She loved to help others and had a strong sense of responsibility, which led to her becoming one of the most respected students. Yet and you're right, you're right, Progenster. People hated Hajime, not just because of the manga stuff, but because of like, Everyone, like, Kaori loved Hajime, right? But again, like, why does Kaori love Hajime? Actually, there's a good point. Apparently, apparently, Hajime, like, saved some kind of elderly couple or some kind of, some people in public. And it was a very brave moment. And then Kaori saw that, but she couldn't act. So then she got, like, inspired. And she's like, wow, I want to be like you or something like that. Yet, for some reason, she took a great interest in Hajime. Like, significantly Never explained. more than Never explained. Student, always finding an opportunity to talk to him, even though others would mock him. Most thought that it was because she was trying to help fix Hajime's bad habits of sleeping through class. Mm. I mean, she was known for looking after other people, so it'd make sense that she'd try to help out the so-called problem student when she could. If that was in fact the case, or if Hajime was just more handsome, then the other students <laughs> I mean, wouldn't have had a problem with it. But if he was more handsome, then people wouldn't be upset. That's actually so funny to like, no, it's just that you're not worthy of the princess, you ugly motherfucker. But like if someone else that was like better looking was like how he was getting attention from there, would it be fine then? Like what? It's because he was just an average guy with a motto of mm. hobbies over real life. I guess then it's like, oh, how dare you disrespect Kaori by trying to be with her when she's like this perfect person, but you're so average, but it's so fucking dumb, dude. That his attitude didn't seem to change, even with all the attention from Kaori. Because of this, a lot of the male students became jealous, always thinking, why him and not us? Meanwhile- <laughs> Skill issue! You're not the main character! Get fucked! The girls thought that because Hajime wasn't changing as a person, he was being rude towards Kaori's supposed efforts to make him a better student. As for what Hajime thought of this- So, for him to not change himself, I- I can like, look, look, she's trying to help him, right? She's trying to help him out. She thinks that he could be a better person and be a productive member of society and learn how to socialize and, you know, stop sleeping in and all that kind of bullshit. But I don't know. It sounds like to me, Hajime is a giga chat that's refusing to bend to the norms of society and is being staying true to himself. And all these other motherfuckers are getting upset for no fucking reason. You know what? They should get mad at Kaori instead. That's right. They should be bullying Kaori. <laughs> You just, just kidding. couldn't understand why the most beautiful girl in school would care about a guy like him. Because you're the main you character! there was an ulterior motive behind her whole look after- Now, this is spicy. If there is an ulterior motive behind their whole look- and There isn't. No, there isn't. But if there was, that would be spoilers. And that would be some insane plot twists. There are other students, Maxim. And there was no way someone like her would ever be interested in someone like him. I mean, he was the embodiment of an average person with- I mean, let's get real, guys. Like, no, straight up, straight up, though. Like, is, is he wrong? Why would anyone give a fuck about Hajime? Ever be interested in someone like him? Why? But there is a moment. People said there is a defining moment when Hajime took brave action and Kaori became inspired because of it. If that's the case, then that actually makes sense. But with, without that in mind, without that being explained at all, what the fuck does she have in common with this dude? Why the fuck is she giving him so much more attention other than the fact that he's a main character and they're trying to write this character in a position to be hated? It just, I never questioned it beyond that because it's like, yeah, it makes sense. You're getting a popular girl, you know, simping over the main character. That's kind of like an average joke to relate to the main demographic watching this show to pander towards that audience. Makes fucking sense to me. I mean, he was the embodiment of an average person with zero outstanding traits while she was, well, a goddess. So, it just didn't make sense why she was always so fixated on him and him alone. Anyway, 
Kaori would come in every morning and greet Hajime at his desk, and today was no different. He casually oh, this is episode back, zero, yeah. then was confronted by Kaori's other friends. First, we have Shizuku Yagashi, Best an girl. undefeated kendo champion who was peerless with did not know she was undefeated. Even better. Oh my god, she's a kendo champion? Sword. Being she definitely has a dojo, man. You know how I meme about how girls with dojos and I want to inherit their dojos? She definitely fucking has a dojo. Quite popular, not only inside school, but outside as well, since mm. she's been featured in many magazines before. Next, we have Koki Amanogawa. She's featured in magazines? She's just getting more credit the more I get to know her, man. Okay, Koki, this motherfucker. I honestly... I'm too mean to Koki, man. I feel like I feel like I shit on him because he's on the hero party. He is the hero party, right? He is the hero. Even they're all hero class, he is literally the hero. And if you look at everyone else, his armor is like pay to win armor. And even though he seems to be a good person, I thought there was always this like ulterior motive behind the scenes. Because I thought he was like this pretty handsome kid that um, has this self-righteous front. And isn't really showing off that he's evil, right? Like Daisuke, he, I'm a guy, he always shows up he's a piece of shit. Hero Koki never really did, but behind the scenes, you kind of see a little, you know, you know what I mean? He doesn't seem to be all there. He seems to be kind of like a piece of shit too, especially in the season finale when Hajime saved everybody and Koki was like kind of getting really upset and irritated, right? So I was like, at that point, it's like, okay, is Koki going to like fall to the dark side? I'm not sure. Even in season two right now, like, he hasn't really done anything. He's still being depressed and being emo. I wonder if he's going to have, like, what's the word? Redemption or if he's just going to be a piece of shit. Oh, uh, who many consider to be the embodiment of... <laughs> this is what Koki looks like in the, in the light novel manga. <laughs> okay. He looks like such a dick here, man. <laughs> Perfection. Because he was athletic, handsome, oh, had wow. outstanding grades and... Wait, the, what the fuck is this? Hold up, hold up. This is, this, this is, uh... Not this handsome... <laughs> Had outstanding grades and they Oh, making com getting combined to Miyuki as well. Hold up. Handsome, had outstanding. Miyuki's there too. Outstanding grades and they supposedly strong sense of justice. Mm, and too strong. I'd argue too strong sense of justice to the point it's like, bro, get over yourself. You're like, you're being so fucking cringe. Was Ryutaro Sakagami, Koki's Who? best friend. Is he still around? Have I seen this character? Huh. I kind of do maybe remember a taller dude that's all round Koki at times, but I guess it's because he's wearing armor and because that's why I can't recognize him with the, the helmet. Maybe he wears like a helmet as hair is guard. I don't know. I kind of remember someone taller around him, but completely forgot about him. He was a muscle head who loved hard work and determination. Oh. So that made it hard for him to get along with Hajime. Sounds like a good guy, but yeah, I guess if Hajime is being like a lazy guy, it doesn't make sense. Since Hajime never showed any of those things. Now, out of these three, Yaigashi was the only one who treated uh. Hajime somewhat kindly. <laughs> somewhat kindly? No, don't tell me that she was a dick too in the manga. No, please. Whereas Koki disliked Hajime for the same reason as many of the other guys. He thought Hajime was taking advantage of Kaori's kindness. But it was actually the opposite. Hajime wanted nothing more than for Kaori to just leave him alone. Yeah, of be course, gone. If he said that, he'd forever be the most hated guy in school. That's true. Holy shit. Hajime is in this shitty ass position where like the most popular girl adores him. So all the guys get jealous. But if he were to then deny the popular girl, would the other guys be happy about that? No, there's no winning. They'd be like, how dare you treat her like that? What the fuck do you want? It's like, okay, I, there is no fucking winning from this. It's just, it's just bullshit. You don't win. You just lose. So it was just best to say nothing at all. As maybe, maybe we should go with the teacher, man. Maybe we should go with the fucking teacher. I mean, the teacher has been getting rizzed up like insane recently. Amanogawa tries to get Hajime to distance himself from Kaori. Kaori herself chimes in to say that she's talking to Hajime because she wants to. <coughs> Actually, I'm talking to Hajime. Please, can you leave us alone, bitch? Get the fuck out of my face, Daisuke. Talking to Hajime because she wants to. Needless to say, no one actually believed her words. They all thought that she was just being nice so as to not mm. hurt Hajime's feelings. Especially Amanogawa. You see, he had such faith in his own righteousness. His righteousness. I mean, look at him, bro. Look at him. The manga just makes him look like such a... I don't know. Is it the hair color? Is it the hairstyle? Is, is it his eyes that has a piercing gaze? Something about this just looks more dickish. He just, he just looks so more fucking annoying in the manga than the anime. Just that he felt he was right all the time. Everything mm. he says and thinks must be the truth because to Ooh. him, he can't be wrong. Ooh. That's a dangerous combination. 
self-righteous people, the, the symbol of absolute justice. There is no nuance. There is no context. It's what I think is right or the highway. Even if I misunderstand, it's what I think is right. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of how I run this channel. Fuck you, I'm always right. Anyway, class finished for Hajime just as quick as it started because he slept through the entire thing. Then when lunch came around, he quickly ate his food and went back to sleep. But Kaori had other plans. That's all she he does. noticed that Hajime was already finished eating. So yeah. she sat with him and offered him some more food. Amanogawa saw this and he thought it was absurd for someone like Hajime to eat Kaori's food. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> so he got up. And he's like, bitch, you think that you're going to get Kaori's bento? This bento that we've been fucking dying to eat, but we never could have. They're all just fucking jealous. I wish that Gaudi like fed Hajime the food like straight up like you know how like couples feed each other like bento like that Oh my god if they did that and if we saw the reactions oh So he interrupted them and told Kaori to come eat with him instead She of course declined so Denied Amagawa, Sakagami and the Aigashi joined them instead Now having the four most popular students in school eat lunch with Hajime just made the other students <laughs> glare at him with disgust he just wants to be left alone. Straight up. He just wants to be left alone. This fucking annoying girl, Kaori, shows up out of nowhere, starts fucking feeding us, and then everyone else gets upset even though we want to be left alone. We just ate. We're just trying to take a nap. But we can't even do that. And then all those motherfuckers come join us because they're too insecure now. And now everyone else is getting angry because they just, like, happen to self-insert themselves into Hajime's place when Hajime just wants to be left alone. This is some bullshit, dude. This is actually some bullshit. Even more. And Hajime knew this. It was at that moment that he wished that all four of them would just get summoned to another world or something. From his perspective, they'd be the perfect- Did he say that in the episode zero? Maybe there was a moment like that. I forget. I forget, I forget. Party of four. They were pretty much the most stereotypical type of group to get sent to another world. And just as you'd expect, not a few moments later, a magic circle engraved with yeah, various that shit was patterns hilarious, starts though. to he did? on the floor. Yeah, I, I think he made a comment of like being summoned or some shit like that because this is still a school setting in episode zero. And I knew that this is an isekai anime. So I was like waiting for the moment of like, when is this going to happen? Or when are we getting, when are we all getting like killed or something by a truck? But it's like, oh, a summoning circle actually appeared out of nowhere. Four. The light from it then engulfed the whole room. <laughs> and once it dissipated, not a single student who was there was left. And teacher. This event then became known as the mass high school disappearance incident. And wow. it caused quite a stir across the globe. But what happens in the real world after they get teleported is a story for another time. What happens in the real world after they get teleported is a story for- What? Cause so far- The after- Cause I'm thinking like, is this like really important to the overall plot of Ari Furete right now? Like what happens in the real world or- I don't know. I don't know, but right over, right over here, it is spoiler. Koki here looks really cool, I'm not gonna lie. Look at him. Like, straight it's, it's up, straight up, Kaori, Shizuku, Koki, they look pretty hard. They, the way they're posing right now, the way that he's, like, looking, <laughs> it looks pretty hard. I mean, he looks like the main character here. This, look, this shit looks fucking hard. I'm not gonna lie. I'll give credit where it's deserved. He's posing, Wait okay? another time. We now find ourselves in the first moments that Hajime wakes up after being isekai which is still not even close to where the anime started. Damn. But Hajime awakes to the sight of the mural of Ehit. The goddess of creation Eight. that was on episode two. Goddess of creation. Goddess of creation. Interesting because we have like creation magic as well in the beginning of the first labyrinth, right? But this person, goddess of heat. So it's not god, sorry. I thought it was god of heat. I thought it was, is it goddess? Like it's, a, it's like a female god? I, I don't think it really matters, but, but a heat. Like clearly this is the ultimate evil in this world, right? Clearly this person like gaslit everybody, the liberators, the mavericks. That's why they went to the labyrinth. That's why the labyrinths, you know, the reason why they're so hard is so they could find somebody that could like defeat all the challenges and be worthy enough to receive the ancient magic. And on top of that, receive the lore, you know, the actual truth, right? God, not goddess. Okay, it's, it's the actual god then. So at the end of the day, God is the most evil person. So the kingdom right now is also kind of being controlled by the church. The church obviously has direct ties to God of Heat. But I wonder, like, it, uh, it almost feels like we should team up with the demons. Recently, I've been thinking about, like, maybe we should just fucking team up with the demons, man. Like, I, no, I, I'm sure the story will somehow unfold that it's going to be like three-way peace, right? Because ultimately, it's going to be like beast people, the demons, and the humans. I'm sure as long as like at, at near the end game of this story, Hajime will do something, reunite, like unite everybody on all fronts, and then the church will be expelled. But right now, this is the main baddies. Two. 
He was in some sort of chamber that resembled the inside of an old cathedral, encircled by approximately 30 this pope looking dude so sus man so fucking sus people clad in white robes that looked as if they were praying hajime wasn't alone demons are also stupid i thought there was like very specific demons i mean humans are stupid too i say that we've had more stupid humans than demons but judging on that one labyrinth scene where it was on a cruise ship and everyone was celebrating the victory of some kind of battle and all three all three races were there demons beast people and humans all in peace so i just assumed that maybe this is like the the end game everyone can unite but if the demons are just going to be evil for the end then it is what it is but based on what i saw i feel i somehow it feels like the demons could be reasonable people they're just also just pent up in revenge right now but could be that they're just completely evil and when you give stuff like this kazia you're not spoiling me but you are spoiling me because you're not confirming you're saying yes or no to my theories right what you guys need to do is be very careful about how you discuss this kind of topic with me what you need to do is Steer me away from a conversation instead of giving me hard yes or no's because the more that I kind of like this is a game of like 20 questions, right? I'll ask you a question, you'll say yes or no, and then I'll get like more information based on that. And now I can like exclude some part of the story and like go with that. No, no, no don't, don't be sorry, but like just like be a word like yes and no answers quite often it kind of leads to spoilers, even though you're not intending to spoil it, you know? It seemed that everyone from his class, including those that weren't even in demons, were not on the ship, it was demi humans and elves. My bad, there's fucking elves in this show. What? Did I miss something? Did I, did I miss something? In the classroom, we're all teleported to this new place. They were then greeted by the Pope of the Whole- <laughs> Okay. The anime did not make this Pope look this fucking sus. <laughs> but if you look at a Pope in the manga, dude, how the fuck? How the fuck are you gonna tell me that this is a good person? Look at him. They're not even trying. They're not even fucking trying. Holy church. Ishtar Langbard, who brings them to the room we see here in order to discuss the circumstances of their summoning. Now, you'd expect at least a few students from a class of 36 to be freaking out, but mm. it would seem that no. Amanagawa's charisma and composed attitude managed to calm the rest of the class. Okay. Maids started to flood the hall and pour everyone drinks. I think the this is an overload reference. The help but stare at the real maids that stood before them. I mean, <laughs> even Hajime sneaked a glance. Hey! But as he did, he could feel a glacial stare crossing his back. Cowdy. When he looked towards the direction that he felt it from, he could see Kaori <laughs> happily staring. Oh yeah, that's the happy smile. That that that's what that slipped fucking 180 real quick, man. At him. Because it was her of all people, Hajime could only pretend that he didn't feel anything odd. With everyone now settled, Ishtar begins to present all the information that these students need to know about the world of Tortoise. As we know, there are humans, demons, mm. and demi-humans. I thought that's just it. Humans, demons, demi-humans, the beast people. But there's elves? There's fucking elves in this show? Ancient era where the races got along. I don't know. I don't fucking Humans know, reside in the northern half of the continent, demons in the south, and mm. demi-humans far to the east and- What's on the west side? In a massive forest. We then learn of the lengthy hmm. war that's been raging on for hundreds west of side? years between humans and demons. Demons were by far the more powerful race, but humans had strength in numbers, resulting in a fairly equal balance in power. That was until demons began to gain control of the monsters. Monsters were wild animals that had undergone a magical metamorphosis after- Do you- I, I think I misunderstood something at near end of um, season one. Elves are demi-humans? Okay, okay. I, I, I kind of like misunderstood something at the end of season one because you know the, the demon- the, the blonde demon's lover, the wife girl, right? The, the, the demon girl that we killed in season one at the end. She had magic which were spawning monsters and I think there was a revelation that, oh, in these labyrinths, these monsters are not being randomly spawned. No, you are the one summoning it with magic, right? I think that's a big revelation, I, I think. So these monsters here, but are, are those monsters different from the monsters that we saw in the beginning like this? That's what I was a bit confused because that kind of implies like season one, like what they did with the all, the, all those monsters were technically the demon's monsters. I'm not sure how that works. After having mana poured into them, it made them much more powerful and gave them the ability to use magic. This tipped the power balance in the demon's favor, resulting in the human's guardian deity and supreme ruler who created the world itself to have to summon humans from another world in order to defend this one. You a see, lie. Hajime's world is greater than Tortoise, meaning Hajime and his classmates carry strength that surpasses any human in this world. Well, that's what Ishtar was shown to believe anyway. He what? was apparently shown visions of what to do by their god Ehit. In fact, it was this very ability to have divine visions that landed him this high-ranking position in the whole- 
How real is this divine vision? It's probably just a bunch of fucking bullshit. We really gonna trust this guy? You know, the monster's being spawned, but she just happens to have magic control. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I thought it was like a huge revelation that all these monsters in the labyrinth, it was actually the demon's magic, but never mind. The church. It's because almost every human in Tortoise revered Ehit, and they were made to follow their god's will without question. So it makes sense that those who were supposedly closest to god would be the highest ranking. Now, as we saw in the anime, Hajime's teacher Aiko wasn't god. too fond of what Goddess. she just heard. There was no way she was going to let her students fight in a war. But unfortunately, due to Aiko's child... That changed real quick because there's that one episode where she straight up asked Hajime to sacrifice himself for the war, remember? To protect that one town, and Hajime was straight up like, yay, hey, so um... That's, that's kind of fucked up, teacher. I thought you loved us. You're going to put us in the front of the war. You don't, you don't care about our lives. <laughs> now she's just fine with that like shit. Appearance and attitude, the students didn't really see her as an adult that needs to be respected. Yeah. Instead, she was more like a teacher that needs to be protected. Oh, Even okay. So, in, a, in a good way. In a good way. heard her complaints, and he told Aiko that there was nothing he could do for the students anyway. <laughs> he couldn't return them back to the real world even if he wanted to. That was something only Ahit had the power to do. And it hmm. was only Ahit. So if we defeat God Ahit, then we're gonna get this teleportation magic. Well, te Hajime already has teleportation magic, actually. We got, we got one of those magic recently from an ancient... Uh, it was an ancient magic we acquired from a labyrinth. We, we, don't, we don't really have... I don't, I don't think we can really use it. Anyways, so, so if we defeat the God, then we're just gonna be able to go back home. I, I, I guess that's like the ultimate goal, right? Ahit that could decide to do it. So, yeah. Their ability to return back home relied completely on a supernatural being that no one was sure even existed. Many students began to panic, but Hajime just seemed rather unfazed. I mean, to him, this was an all too familiar premise. Based on all the stories that he's read, it could have been worse. Like, they could have all just been summoned as slaves. So, by Isekai's <laughs> kind of true, <laughs> currently they were doing pretty well. Amanagawa was the one to settle things down, since he figured that because there was no other options, then they might as well fight in hopes of Ahit sending them back afterwards. Eventually, I mean, everyone did come to an agreement. You can kind of shit on Koki all you want, and I do shit on him a lot. I shit on him more than you guys ever have, but I guess, like, he's a pretty good guy. I mean, the leadership right here, I mean, I mean, he helps. Like, he, he, he serves his role here, right? Ishtar smiled, satisfied with the outcome, though something was odd about him, oh, yeah. and Hajime knew it. He decided to take note of all the- Gee, if you give me a character like this in the manga, I really wonder if we can trust them. Hmm, something is odd. Okay, can you, can you guys tell if this guy is a little bit odd based off of this art? When you see this art, does something just scream at you that maybe we shouldn't fucking trust him? Look at him, dude. Look at him. Like, <laughs> the, the author is not trying to be discreet. He's just straight up saying, hey, look. Look at this dude. He's evil. He's fucking evil. All the peculiar aspects of Ishtar's character. It seemed like he was someone that he needed to keep an eye on. With everyone willingly accepting their roles as soldiers in this war, the logical next step for them was to learn Get the how classes. to fight. Ishtar expected this, so he sent them all to the Halai Kingdom, a kingdom with a rich history that had close ties to the church since it was founded by one of Ahit's descendants. Their current location was- Oh, I thought we were always in the same kingdom, but we were actually at a different place when we reported. And now we're in a completely different kingdom just all the time. Oh, I, I didn't even know. The Temple of the Holy Church, which was built at the summit of a mountain. And at Divine the mountain. was the kingdom. Ishtar used a spell called Celestial Path, which created a magic circle that acted as a platform to glide the students down the mountain what? all the way to the capital city of the kingdom. We, don't, we haven't seen while, that, right? Hashime couldn't help but think of how absurd this world was. Just the fact that everything and everyone was dependent on a single god filled him with unease. Mm. The reason being that he was well aware of the numerous tragic outcomes that stem from politics mixing with religion. But those thoughts weren't really helping, so he cleared his head and focused his attention to the massive castle that they were approaching. As if they were following standard isekai procedure, they were taken directly to the king to meet him, his wife, and his son and daughter. No, then we did not- the knight captain. Son and daughter? So there's a prince as well. Like, we haven't met the prince in the anime yet, right? I don't think so. The princess was just fucking retconned in because she was never in anime season one. She just shows out of nowhere in season two. But there's a prince? That's kind of huge, right? Isn't that kind of insane? The prime minister and other dignitaries of the kingdom, after which a huge feast was laid out. Then each student was taken to their own individual rooms to rest up for the night. The next day would mark the beginning of their training. It was to be carried out by the knight captain, Meld Loggins. He what the fuck? Why does Meld look like a douchebag here? T 
dude. What? What? Mel in, in in the anime, he just looks like a like like a like a like a cuddly father. He just looks like a giga chad strong dude who seems very benevolent and nice, and he's very charismatic. Here, <laughs> this looks like Daisuke, the fucking bully with the time skip. What the what the fuck happened here? Mel looks so different here. <laughs> Look at his face, though. Look at his face compared to what the anime Mel did. It's so different. And Captain Mel Loggins. He first handed everyone what's called a status plate. A very important tool that functions both as ID cards and as a personal stat tracker. By placing a drop of blood on the plate, it marks it as your own, then displays various parameters as numerical values. No one was really sure how the plates worked, but what they did know was that they were artifacts left over from the ancient times, made oh. during the Age of Gods when the Wait. greatest descendants still walked the earth. Now. That sounds like just really important shit. Hold up, this is like, I didn't realize the status play with like ancient technology. Normally an artifact like this would be coveted as a national treasure. But there were enough of these status plates to go around that even the average citizen owned one. Conveniently, one the there's enough. facts that the people hmm. of Tortoise were capable of reproducing. And so Why? they were mass manufactured, widely distributed. Why can we mass manufacture this ancient technology from the old times? And then used as identification. Hajime then proceeded to activate his own which caused the plate to turn to a light blue color. This represented the color of his mana. You see, every person's mana had a distinct color. Does it? The plate would change its own color to match that. What is Hajime's color now? Like, was it just black and red? Because sometimes whenever he's transmuted, it's kind of those colors. Interesting. I didn't know mana had a color. Hajime looked around to see what the others were. Amanagawa's was pure white, Ryutaro's oh. dark green, Kaori's a light purple, and Shizuku a deep blue. Then he looked back down and checked his stats. He was level 1 with all parameters set to 10. He had a job of synergist no! and skills of transmutation and language comprehension. Actually kind of insane. Transmute is fucking insane bro. Transmute is a go to skill but right now as a base level synergist kind of weak right. Even language comprehension this is kind of insane for like other stuff we do in the future like conversing with like just anybody right. In Tortoise the average person at level 1 had stats at around 10. Making You're average. Hajime average this we're just this average. Role. But that didn't mean that he couldn't improve them. The highest level a person could reach was 100. And once you got there... But Hajime's level cap was beyond level 100 after he did the whole monsterization, right? All your latent potential would be unlocked. The way you did that was by increasing your stats through rigorous training. If your stats grew, then so did your level. It or, was also okay, noted that you can use magic items to improve your stats as well. Apparently, mana is very useful in assisting with their growth. That's why those with high magic stats often level up faster than others. Then... No, 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 hold up. No, no, no. I, I think the implication there is the more mana you have, the faster you'll level up. Not because you just inherently gain more EXP, but because you'll be stronger, right? So it's not to say that one person with less mana versus another person with more mana, if they killed the same amount of monsters and got the same amount of EXP, they're... they're it, there, there's no difference there, right? There, there, there's no difference there, right? Unless, unless you have more mana and more EXP, then that's just fucking busted. Jobs basically represented innate talent, and it determined the unique skills and abilities that only you could use. Very few people possessed a job, but for those that had them, they were split. <laughs> Very few people possessed a job. <laughs> I don't know, that's just hilarious to me out of context. Into combat and non-combat disciplines. The combat jobs were highly rare, with only one in every thousand or ten thousand oh, yeah. people land. This is one of the coolest things too in the intro is like they were like they were kinda hyping up all these different classes. It's like, oh this is a one in ten thousand job, oh my god. Regardless, Hajime was worried about his current stat level. I mean, he was supposed to be more powerful than the average person. Yet here he was, still average. Nah, Mouth just wait, then just wait everyone to present their stats. So of course Amanogawa stepped up first. <laughs> the his hero. job was hero with stats all sitting at 100 wow. and a whole bunch of skills to boot. That's some In bullshit! This was about a third of Meld's strength. Oh. Meld was level- Damn, I, don't, I actually don't know how strong Meld is. Because I, I still really don't know how strong Meld is. He's pretty competent though. 62, with all his stats within the 300 Damn. Range, he was said to be one of the strongest humans alive, but with- That's crazy. Those stats are 300. One of the strongest humans alive. And we know at the end of Hajime, even Hajime meeting up with Yue, the stats levels were 800, and by the time they cleared the first labyrinth, his stats were in 10,000s, right? It just kind of gives you this insane difference of power that you can't even just compare. Amanagawa now around, he would be surpassed in no time. Hajime hoped that Amanagawa was just a special case, but 
as more people showed their stats, they all had crazy skills and combat-based yeah. jobs. Yeah. Not as good as the Monogawas, but still strong enough to be considered useful. Hajime I mean, if your friends are getting different classes, different skills, like God's Apostle, Sword Master, while you have fucking synergist, it doesn't really feel that good, right? Seemed to be the only one with a non-combat-based job and a couple skills. And it's Aww. not like he could learn new skills either. Sure, there did exist- <laughs> It's just funny to me, because right now he can't, but we know that <laughs> he just eats monsters and gets a shitload of all these new skills, but okay, go on. These things called derivative skills that could be acquired, but that required a lifetime of work polishing a single talent. So things were looking quite bleak for Hashime. I didn't realize derivative skills are actually that important. Even like Airwalk, right? The, the bunny skill that we got. The Airwalk is actually a derivative skill. It takes you a fucking lifetime. But I guess obviously to Hajime when he's training, it's a bit different scaling. The time finally came around for him to present his own stats, and he knew what was coming. Yama took no time to begin the harassment. This piece of shit! Because, according to Mel, Fuck you! the synergist was kind of like a blacksmith, and it was so he's common not wrong. that every one in ten people had the class. Since I mean, you're not wrong. We're, we're blacksmithing, but we're blacksmithing fucking submarines now. We're blacksmithing like missiles. We're blacksmithing like fucking this giant ass SUVs, like Hummers that just drive in the desert. Like, this skill is insane. His stats were nothing special either. Hyama just kept spouting insults. Kyo hey, what the fuck does he have? What class is he on? Actually, we've never seen any of his. Like, what has he really done? I've never seen him use a technique. All he's done so far is just run away, hide, and backstab meld. That's pretty much it. Mori was about to say something, but then Aiko Sensei intervened to show that Hajime wasn't the only one with a non combat class. You're not making me feel she better. She had been given the job of a farmer, with many skills related to it. Okay, when she got the farmer job, I just bursted out laughing. Because, you know, again, I didn't understand how important this farmer class was, right? Because I thought that. Classes like this was just complete jobber skill. It's literally a jobber skill. You're straight up a fucking farmer. You're not some kind of sword maiden. You're not some kind of like spear master, right? But this farmer skill is actually so insane what it does outside of combat. Everything it does outside of combat, literally raising cult like crops and being able to like have a thriving like a country, right? It just enables so much. It's, it's, it's very important to the point that I think the church is afraid of her, right or actually it's a bit different because the demons currently are also part of the plan because the demons was it the church as well no yeah i mean no i actually don't know who the fuck is manipulating daisuke because if that's the case then the demons are also in on it but the demons are attacking anyways everybody's scared of the teacher she's cracked but had average stats and everything else except for magic holy shit a hundred magic he understood that aiko was trying to make him feel better but even she had a specialty of her own there really was nothing Hajime could do to avoid being labeled as the weakest. And sure enough, after two weeks had gone by, he was widely known as the most useless member of the class. Jesus. Don't get me wrong though, I mean, he had spent days in training, hoping that he would be able to increase his stats. But even after reaching level 2, his stats only stood- This is the most disappointing shit, cause like, you- cause like, even after getting transported, even after getting used to Kai and like, getting new classes and jobs, like we're still getting fucking boy like this now. Like, oh my fucking god! But just wait, just let him cook. But a meager twelve. This only served to emphasize how weak he was, because in that same time, Monogawa was now level ten, and he had stats of two hundred all across the board. Hajime didn't even have an affinity for magic, which is one of the major mechanics of magic in the world of Tortoise. So, how does magic work exactly? I don't well, know. By chanting an incantation, one oh. can transfer their mana into a magic circle. Incantation, I forgot about that. It's all the noob shit everyone does, right? Because it's so funny to me when everyone incant they, they have to they have to say lines for like fucking 30 seconds to do magic. But now Yue and Hajime, they can just do incantationless casting right off the bat, right? The spell was inscribed into that specific magic circle. And after enough mana was transferred to it, the spell would be activated and cast. Every spell required its own magic circle. And the length of the incantation was directly proportional to how much mana one could pour into it. Likewise, the effectiveness of the spell was proportional to the amount of mana used to cast it. And the more complicated the spell was, the greater the area of effect it had. Just, just use more mana. The more mana you have, the better the spell will be. So, say I wanted to cast a standard fireball spell. That would require a magic circle of about 10 centimeters across. Okay. This magic circle would include all the inscriptions for the element, strength, range, span, and mana capacity. You know, 
I never really understood how these magic circles worked. I thought they were just random drawings, but now I guess they actually mean something like element string, like different shapes and stuff like this. The number is here. I don't know. I thought it was just like random shit they were just drawing for fun, straight up. I thought it was just they're drawing stuff, like programming. Yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of how they handle the Mahoka, right? These magic sequences, they all have meaning. So it's code, pretty much. So if I wanted much. to improve on any of these parameters, then extra inscriptions would be needed that accounted for these changes, resulting in a larger magic circle and a longer incantation. There was, however, one exception to this rule, though, and mm -hmm. that was magical affinity, a mechanic that allows a magic caster to shorten their inscriptions. Oh, or example, no inscription. If someone had an affinity for the fire element, then they would no longer need to add the element portion of the inscription to their spell. What? Instead, they would replace that part with a mental image. In other words, they didn't the need to carve the inscription anywhere into the magic circle. So long as they were imagining flames while chanting the spell, the fire element would be added to it. Meaning, the standard 10 centimeter magic circle would Get actually shrimp. be smaller since the element portion wouldn't be in it, also making cast time faster. So technically size isn't everything. Size isn't everything here because I thought that these like magic circles, the more that like an anime, whenever you're watching anime and there's like a cool magic spell happening, there's like a huge ass magic circle happens and then it's like concentric circle. It's like it gets stacked like boom, 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 boom. Like in Konosuba too, I think whenever they do crazy meteor, there's like 20 different fucking circles stacking on top of each other. But here, technically, if you have the affinity, then you don't have to say that shit and you can just imagine it and the circle gets smaller. So circle getting smaller doesn't necessarily mean smaller like weaker magic now every student had some level of magical affinity well every student except for hajime this wah, made magic-based combat completely impractical for him since the cast time of any spell would be way too long and it's not like he could take anyone on in physical combat either his stats were just too low the only thing he could do was use his transmute skill to transform the shape of various ores and forge them together into alloys still he trained this skill his only skill eventually becoming able to make pitfalls and protrusions in the ground. The more he trained, the bigger and larger he was able yeah, to- Yes, look, look at this, the transmute fucking d dug the hole, like this is so dangerous. ...to make them. But he had to be in direct contact with what he was transmuting in order for it to work. Because of that, it wouldn't be very useful in direct combat. In the end, he just accepted his role as being the useless one, studying in the library to pass the time. All the while feeling that he should just head toward the land of the demi-humans because oh. they also didn't possess any mana and just like Hajime... Interesting. Hajime wanted to just go to the demi-human place? That would have been an... I, what kind of life would he have lived? Would he have met Shay like that? We're discriminated for it. You see, due to the strong religious presence in Tortoise, oh, it yeah. was a common belief that Ahit and the... It's, it's human superiority, right? They had, they're super racist towards anyone else but humans. ...other gods shaped the very foundations of the world with magic. And the magic that everyone uses today is a lesser version of the power that the gods once held. A gift, only bestowed upon those who were deemed worthy. So, because the demi-humans couldn't use magic... They're not worthy, they're just kind of like, they're just beast people, right? The, you don't use magic, magic is basically, the, you know, represents god, you're not one of god's people, therefore trash is their mind, like, idea, I think. They were seen as wicked creatures abandoned by the gods, and as such, highly discriminated against. Demons treated them in a similar way too. They had their own god to worship, one that gave them a much higher magical affinity than any. Demons have their own god to worship. So that's the thing I keep getting confused about because quite often they keep mentioning gods in different contexts. And I'm like, is, are they always mentioning god a heat? Now, whenever the church people, whenever the human side mentions a god, then it is, it is a heat. But whenever the demons mention their own god, I'm like, they can't be worshiping the same god, makes no fucking sense. Any human, resulting in their ability to cast spells with shorter incantations and smaller circles. Damn. So it only made sense that they'd also see the demi-humans as inferior. Anyway, even though Hajime could relate to how the demi-humans felt, he really only wanted to go there just to touch some animal ears. But visiting the eastern nations... He just wanted, he just, he just wanted to pet the, the cute little bunny girl from the cat girl, that's all he wanted. Wasn't I don't really blame likely. him. Realistically, the only place he could go to was Arasan, the home of the seamen. Me actually <laughs> One more time. <laughs> one, more, one more time. Realistically, the only place he could go to was Arasan, the home of the seamen. Who actually weren't discriminated against because the they what? produced 80% of the kingdom's seafood. Getting there was the hard part though, since it involved crossing a massive desert that was home to one of the seven labyrinths of the world, a key feature of Tortoise that we'll cover another day. 
Anyway, Hajime got so caught up in thinking about the places he could visit that he forgot he had to go to training. So he rushed over to the grounds, got bullied a bit by Hiyama, then was told that everyone would be leading an expedition into the Great Orcus Labyrinth in the morning. Oh, we're about this to get was betrayed. Another one of the seven that was just mentioned. It's a massive dungeon that had a depth of over 100 floors, and the deeper you went, the stronger the enemies became. Still though, someone told me that these this floor, this labyrinth that we went to, it actually wasn't even like the true labyrinth or something, and the floors there's actually more below or something. I I, I remember a comment explaining to me how Azumi is like the school, the the hero group where they were in was not even really the true labyrinth. There were many floors that was like even more dangerous below or something. The early floors were a popular training spot for adventurers, especially because the monsters there carried a higher quality of mana crystals. What are these mana crystals you ask? Well, it's the core of a monster. And they were very important components in magic circle creation. You see, they allowed for a more efficient transferal of mana, as well as made for a very effective source of power making them useful as tools for both the military and the commoners. Of course, the more powerful the monster, the bigger and purer the crystal would be. This also meant that the monster could use higher leveled spells, and they didn't even need a magic circle to cast them. OP, this was how? useful Why? information for any adventurer to know, and Hashime contemplated it on the journey towards the labyrinth. He eventually ended up at an outpost town known as Horad, which really only had the purpose of housing those that wanted to challenge the labyrinth. This would be the new training ground for Hajime and his classmates. Didn't even and know we moved that's locations. that's pretty much how they got to the start of episode 1. So that's crazy. I still have like 50 more pages of Salazar 84's research on episode 1 to go through. But I think for now this was a decent amount of information that gives more context as to how everyone got to where they were, as well as how the universe of Tortoise functions. Anyway, since this is a new series, I'm gonna pull a typical YouTuber thing here. And oh. ask that you drop a like. Drop a like! Subscribe to the video, another dub video from Annie News, as usual, even though this is an older video. But it's crazy, huh? Like, this is everything that happened before episode one. That's fucking insane. If I, if, and even if, like, I would have not known what the fuck was going on if I didn't watch episode zero. But on top of that, there's so much of all this material that was never explained. Like, how the fuck are you supposed to know? You're not. You're supposed to read the light novel, I guess, but... It's crazy. But hey, we do these reactions live on stream, 7 a.m. on YouTube, PST, YouTube, and Twitch. So I hope to see you there.